Good afternoon and welcome to Oasis Church International and Oasis Community Development Center to our Mental Health and Civil Unrest Forum on today. Today we have um, some awesome panelists that I will be introducing and having them to speak a little bit more about themselves as we talk about mental health and and Okay, as we talk about um, mental health and the civil unrest. So first I'd like to introduce um, Officer Dexter Mills, who's a corporal at the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office. Officer Mills, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, uh, my name is um, Dexter Mills. I'm a corporal with the um, Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office. Um, I've been in, in law enforcement for a total of um, 35 years, and I work various age, um, areas throughout the agency um, and um, other agencies, um, such as South Bay um, Police Department. Um, I'm, in the, um, I'm a corporal in the training division, um, and um, I um, attended school at um, Palm Beach Atlantic University. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in leadership and organizational management. I um, have a master's in business administration and public administration. And um, as of January of this year, I'm considering um, walking away. You know, I think I. Um, have outlived my time <laughs> and, or, or whatever. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, want to venture on and do different things. However, I'm, I'm glad to be on the uh, panel today and um, I'm looking uh, forward to um, having a great day. Thank you so much, Officer Mills. So um, we are going to now go to um, Kashamba Miller who is our um, educator in Palm Beach County School District. She's also a city council person for the city of Riviera Beach. And she is my classmate from Suncoast High School as well as John F. Kennedy Middle School. Welcome, Kashamba. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa and Pastor Stan and everyone that's um, joining us today. As Lisa stated, we go way back to John F. Kennedy Junior High School. Um, I attended schools in Riviera Beach. I was born and raised in Riviera Beach. I attended John F. Kennedy as well as graduated from Suncos High School. Um, went on to receive my bachelor's degree in elementary education from Palm Beach Atlantic. And I received my master's in educational leadership with Nova Southeastern University. I've been with the Palm Beach County School District for close to 22 years. I've been a teacher, a reading coach, and I'm currently an assistant principal. I also am a city council person for the city of Revere Beach, as Lisa stated earlier. And I've been with the city for six years now. I just um, started my third term in March. And I'm married to my high school sweetheart, Mr. Joseph Anderson, who is also uh, Port of Palm Beach Commissioner as well. So I, I'm i elated to be on the panel and to interact with all of you and just talk a little bit about what's going on in our city and our state at this time. Thank you. Thank you. You see Palm Beach Atlantic is representing on today. Uh, my undergrad is from Palm Beach Atlantic University as well. Now we're going to um, hear from our licensed family um, and mental health therapist, and he's no other than Matthew Jean. If you would just introduce yourself. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Matthew Jean. It's such an honor to be here among such distinguished uh, panelists. Oh my gosh, I feel like I shouldn't even be on the panelists with such distinguished individuals, but. I am happy to be here and I'm happy to share my voice to this uh, wonderful organization, the Oasis International Church. Uh, I think Lisa and I tried to have a, tried to create a program last time, but I think scheduling were, were conflicting and we didn't get a chance to 
uh, make that happen. But I'm happy to be here. Like I said, my name is Matthew Jean. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. I am not from Palm Beach. I am from Miami, <laughs> mm -hmm. Miami, Florida. Uh, I matriculated through the public school system in Miami. I graduated and went on to Florida a &M University. And uh, I was in a marching band up there, Go 100, you know? Hey. And, that, and that's where the Palm Beach connection, I think, first started for me because I met a lot of great musicians from Suncoast. <laughs> wonderful musicians and we still have great ties with them uh, until this day. Uh, I finished my bachelor's in a small HBCU in Alabama called Oakwood University where I studied psychology and theology. I completed uh, uh, my master's at Nova Southeastern University in family therapy and then the West Palm Beach connection really uh, blossomed when I was in my graduate program because Palm Beach was where I got most of my mental health training. You know, I, I uh, interned at the Fa Center for Family Services on Southern and Parker. I also worked at Gratitude House, which is which was now closed, but I worked there for about two and a half, maybe three years. And I worked for a multicultural community mental health in Palm Beach as well. And so currently I serve uh, at my private practice, Beachstone Counseling here in Pompano Beach, Florida. And of course I see clients in all three counties, Dade, Broward and Palm Beach. I do specialize in black male issues and I'm, I am married with four beautiful girls, three of which are triplets. Hooray. <laughs> yeah. I'm also, which, which, which kind of segue to the next part of my, uh, my journey. I became a children's author because I have kids. I wanted to share stories with characters that resemble my kids and stories that could help them grow and mature in the way that I felt was relevant. And so currently I have two books out on Amazon. I have a third book coming out uh, this summer, next month, in fact. And so I'm looking forward to sharing that with the community as well. So I'm happy to be here, happy to serve, and thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Yes, when Matthew shared that he has triplets, I was like, wow, <laughs> it really does happen. Um, thank you so much, Matthew. I would like to introduce my um, brother. He is my biological brother. Um, and he is an international author, Raphael De Freitas. How you doing, everybody? Um, my name is Raphael De Freitas. I am Lisa's little brother. Uh, I'm an international best-selling author on Amazon. Okay. Me and my wife have a publishing company. Uh, I'm a certified uh, life purpose coach. And also, I'm a Marine veteran. Um, I'm grateful for this opportunity to speak. Uh, and uh, if anybody have any questions, uh, you could ask. Uh, <clears throat> basically, uh, I help uh, young men um, who went through traumatic stuff or either older men, it really don't matter. Uh, basically tell a story in an anthology, but uh, basically uh, anonymous. So they can really get it out and they find healing. Uh, my wife actually started the project. It's called uh, Brutal Courage, Time to Tell Movement. Uh, and yeah, uh, that's basically what I'm doing now. I uh, have a few kids myself, uh, stepkids and a daughter. My youngest daughter, she's seven now, but she became a published author at uh, five. I helped her do her story. I illustrated everything. Uh, if y'all know anybody who want to get published for the low, we do uh, business like layaway at Walmart. So <laughs> you ain't got to worry about breaking your pockets right off the uh, rip. <laughs> so um, yeah, okay. thank you for having okay. me. Okay. All right, awesome, awesome. I'm so proud of my little brother. Um, and then um, we are also going to hear from um, Kitty, Kitty London um, from the People of Power show and her son, Kobe. Um, Kitty, you wanna say hello and your son um, say hello to us. I know we have a, a um, lot of people on the panel and I will let you all know the purpose of this forum of, on today. But Kitty, if you want to just grace us and say hello. You're muted. Unmute myself. Hello, everyone. <laughs> um, I'm Kitty London and I just wanna thank the Oasis Church International for this wonderful program and Lisa again for inviting me when you mentioned earlier the introvert and the extrovert I'm the extrovert he's the introvert so yeah so I may do more talking so just letting you know that um, <laughs> I am also a Suncoast graduate I have a film and television degree associate in science 
and I have my bachelor's in mass communication and journalism. And yes, I am the host and creator of the People of Power show. And every week I sit down with influential people, people who are doing wonderful things in the community and also globally. And, you know, I'm just a, a face in media that I think that we need right now because we have to tell our own stories and no one can tell our stories better than we can. So I am also a songwriter, a producer, a actress. Uh, I, I One time for Chic and Curvy, I, I model for them as well. So I'm just a little bit of everything, but I'm just happy to be here and use me as you see fit, Lisa. And if you have any questions for me, uh, feel free to ask. And Kobe, just grab to say, hey, Kobe. So hey, they'll, they'll at least know you can talk. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. I'm currently in 12th grade. I'm okay. graduate from Palm Beach State. Uh, my college of choice is Palm Beach State College. I'm currently undecided in what major I'm going to pursue, but I'm thinking about being a graphic designer. And I'm awesome. Awesome. I'm going to put him to work in my production company. He doesn't know that yet. but he Oh, gosh, definitely. you just stole him. I was just getting ready to steal him from you. <laughs> you can eat I'm hey, sure my he, he can be used. <laughs> he needs to build his portfolio, so yeah. use him. Yes, yes. <laughs> thank you so much, though. We're happy to be here. And thank amongst you. everyone else, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> and then we have none other than our male. If you were on our mental health forum um, about a month ago, you would have seen none other than Josiah Manners who talked about um, the pandemic and mental health. And he is here um, this afternoon to talk about um, mental health and the civil unrest and how it has affected him possibly and um, maybe his friends, how he feels about it. Josiah, introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. My name is Josiah Manners. I am a communication arts freshman at Alexander W. Dreyfus Jr. School of the Arts. Uh, like I said, I have a passion within communication arts, and I'm glad to be here to uh, share a little bit about what I have to say. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Welcome, Josiah. Welcome, everyone. Facebook. We are on Facebook. We're streaming live on YouTube as well. We are on our website, Oasis Church International, oasischurchintl.org, and we are on YouTube. I am minister and evangelist Lisa Johnson with Oasis Church International, and I am the mental health coordinator. I guess I need to just, you know, um, talk about my credentials. I'm also a human resource professional for a upscale um, continuing care retirement community um, in Lantana, Florida. I have a bachelor's degree from Palm Beach Atlantic University. I also have an associate's degree, degree from Kaiser. I have a master's degree from Nova Southeastern University. I am an author of I'm Coming Out, 31 Days of Renewal, and um, my publisher is none other, than, none other than my pastor, Cassandra Fullwood, Cassie's Touch Publishing. Um, I will be writing another book. I am a mental health advocate. Um, this is from personal experience as well as experience in uh, my family. So this, this, this stems way back for me. So we will be dealing with one today, just the mental health um, mental health, we know, is a um, worldwide crisis. So um, last year, we were faced with coronavirus, this pandemic that swept the nation, swept the world. And in the midst of um, coronavirus, you know, we had some civil unrest and it just it just wasn't fair. You know, we were already dealing with, you know, some health um, pandemics, and then we had to deal with um, an, an all known subject that has been around for many, many years, but it was very heightened last year. And I wanted to get in the minds of our young males, especially, you know, how did that make them feel? We also have um, on our Zoom, we have some young females because um, we know that the civil unrest, social unrest has actually disturbed the entire family. And not just African Americans, but also um, races of all, all races, it has um, affected. But I want to primarily reach out to the Black community because um, there is a stigma and um, statistics shows it as well as all of the media, 
um, shows what has been going on. Now, I will say this, we have an awesome um, officer from the Palm Beach County Sheriff Office that we're not gonna be up today um, because I know that, you know, dealing with the um, civil unrest and social unrest, police brutality, um, there is also, you know, so much that people say about officers, but there's also good um, officers out there as well. So that's why I have um, Officer Dexter Mills on today to talk about some of the trainings that officers receive and what he has done and why he got into law, law enforcement. So I want to kind of start out with one of, with one of our youth, Josiah. I um, just wanted to find out when you heard of, I'm going to speak particularly about George Floyd, but I know through education and history, you probably have heard about many of the other um, lives that have been lost, male and female, at the hands of officers. And how has that made you feel as a young Black man? Um, it opened my eyes to see something that I wasn't really seeing before. Um, I, you know, you, we've heard about police brutality. It's happened right here in our own communities, but for George Floyd, it, it hit really hard for me. Um, personally, I'm a lover of all things, politics and government. Um, so as just to, what was that? Like last month or the month before, as we were sitting through and watching the trial of George Floyd, and as they were recounting all of the, the terrible things that happened, like I said, not only did it open up my eyes to see this problem, but it made me want to do something about it. It gave me a charge to say, okay, I know I may not have the world at my fingertips. I may not have the world to impact, but those who are close to me, those who I know, I can make an impact there. And that can help to spark a, a continual, uh, I guess, a continual motion where I'm, I'm telling you, you know, this, is, this isn't right. Um, and it just, there was, there was not many words that I could really put to explain, really to explain how I felt. There was feelings of anger. There was feelings of confusion. There was feelings of, I, I don't know. It was just such a mixed, um, it was just it gave me a lot of mixed emotions because I just really had to sit down and say, what, what am I supposed to feel about this? It's happened before. I wasn't necessarily affected, but now as I've grown and I've opened up my eyes to see what's going on, what am I supposed to feel? So uh, that's sort of how I felt about it. Wow, thank you so much for sharing that, Josiah. Um, anger, um, confusion, do you hear that world? Um, anger, confusion, mixed emotions, and then just the question, what am I supposed to feel? Like, you know, um, it, it makes me think about even the younger children that are even younger than Josiah, and they hear everything that, you know, is being taught in their home. Um, we, we definitely have to deal with this, and I um, implore you, um, Josiah, just implore, you know, you to go and, you know, organize whatever you want to get with some, you know, legislators, get with council people, get with mayors, get with um, police officers, you know, and definitely you're making a difference already. Josiah is also um, in Delta Sigma Theta's um, Embody, which is, which is our youth male program as well. So you can make a difference. And, you know, the thing about it is that in the Christian community, we believe that you're supposed to love everyone. And that's another reason why I kind of wanted to, you know, bring this together to hear from our children. We want the racism to stop. And we don't want our children to now, because I believe that the George Floyd incident actually, it, it, it just like catapulted like so much from what happened years ago to almost like a breaking point, like this is it. And I think everyone felt that. I think it was felt amongst all the races. I think it was felt amongst the different religions. And um, us as being Christians, we're taught because if we have the love of Jesus Christ on the inside of us, we're taught to love everyone. So how do we, um, how do we live with um, dealing with police brutality? And I'm gonna ask Matthew Jean, 
um, our, our, our therapists on today, you know, what can you say to the young men um, like Josiah, you know, dealing with that anger and still loving people just for who they are. And, and I am going to get to Officer Mills because he's a good cop. <laughs> um, but yes, Matthew, if you can just kind of answer that question. Uh, first of all, let me say to Josiah, I definitely empathize with your sentiments that you shared. And um, I remember being your age and having my brother who was five years older than I am, hospitalized by cops. And when the George Floyd situation happened and re-traumatized me to the point where I had to go seek mental health counseling as well. And so even though I'm on the side of assisting, we're not immune to it either. And one of the things that I've done well as a mental health professional is guiding the avenues of my soul. Guiding the avenues of my soul, meaning making sure that I can have a healthy relationship with media, a healthy relationship with the content that I ingest because eventually it will come to me through different forms, through friends, through family members, and predominantly through my clients, you know? So I could definitely empathize with you and of course, make myself available to talk if you need to, you know, process this some more uh, because it's not easy. Like I said, it definitely re-traumatized me. So what do we do with the anger? Well, let me go backwards for a second because we're talking about 2020. And in 2020, there was so much going on that this seemed like another blow, you know? Of course, we had um, at the beginning of the year, you know, uh, I remember one of the first things that really hit me hard was Kobe Bryant's death, you know? That was like, oh my gosh, what a year this is gonna, you know? And then, and then we heard there was fires in Australia and then there was, you know, and then we heard that there was a, you know, an, an illness going around and then we heard about COVID-19 and then there was, you know, social distancing and then, you know, the way we interacted with each other shifted as well. And then of course, when the shutdown started, it created even more anxiety and panic. And then of course the social unrest followed shortly after. And so what, we're, what we were dealing with were compounded issues before you have an opportunity to fully process and address what you're actually feeling based on one thing, something else comes in and it knocks you side your head again. And you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't even have an opportunity to finish understanding why I'm feeling this way based on the first thing that I experienced. And now there's another thing, and then there's another thing, and then there's another thing. And so it puts us in a state of being very vulnerable, very raw. And the emotions come to the surface sometimes because of mismanagement and not having all the tools to manage those emotions. Sometimes the emotions come to the surface and it leaves us extremely vulnerable. And anger is a part of the entire process of what we feel because I think a lot of what we were feeling without even knowing was grief. And grief is about a distortion of our reality, one reality being present and then that reality being taken away from you and then another reality being presented to you. So with COVID-19 and, and, and social distancing, we were comfortable in one particular reality. That reality was taken away from us because of you know, the anxiety and because of the social distancing uh, and knowing that we're relational beings, being of African descent, we love to fellowship. And if you remove that from us, you're, you're removing one of our most healthiest coping mechanisms. We gather together, not just in the church settings, but in the homes, in our communities, at the parks, you remove that from us. Now you're putting us in a space where we're even less likely to cope in a healthy way. And so you have all these multiple areas of stress that you're dealing with. And a part of the grief, like I said, is the removal of one reality and trying to manage the adjustment to a new reality. So in the process of grief, you have stuff like uh, denial, you know, like, I can't believe this is happening. You know, you make statements like this, like, what is actually going on out there? And then bargaining, like, maybe if, you know, you start asking questions to see if you can rationalize uh, in some way, form or fashion to understand what's going on. So you try to insert yourself as a solution or insert some type of understanding as a solution to what is going on um, in general. And then the next stage after uh, denial, bargaining, is anger, you know? And the anger is the loss of something that you actually value. 
And so our reality is valued because that's a part of what keeps us stable. You know, when we're in a, a, a stable environment, it, it's a part of something that we need to function day to day to react and interact and exchange. And so in the absence of that, of course, you're going to express anger. And then to see someone that looks like you, someone that could be your brother, your uncle, your, your cousin, some, you know, to see someone lose their life in real time, it damages you. That's traumatic. And so to add trauma to all the other experiences that we were dealing with, it's going to heighten all of the other emotions that we're dealing with. So let's talk about how we address that, how we deal with it. Well, one of the first things is the acknowledgement of it. A lot of us sometimes normalize these things and it's not by default. Sometimes this is what we have been taught to do. These things happen so frequently that we have to learn how to tie up our bootstraps and keep going, not necessarily given the appropriate time to process, to understand, to manage, and then to detox away from it, and then to learn coping mechanisms to get you to a healthy space, you know? So processing it, understanding it, managing it, and building the healthy coping mechanisms is some of the ways we can start, or some of the ways we can start managing our anger. And if the anger is disrupting, you know, it's disruptive in your day to day, then of course, I would suggest that we go and seek professional help. But regularly, normally, what, you know, what we need to make sure that we're doing is checking in with ourselves and asking ourselves relevant questions to figure out what is going on inside to see what it is that we can do to change what it is that we're experiencing. So ask yourself, what have I been thinking? What are the thoughts that have been going on in my mind that are connected to the emotion that I'm experiencing? What are the emotions that are connected to the experiences? So it works both ways. And then of course, what is my actual body feeling? Your body does not lie to you. You know, last year I had a lot of back pain, a lot of neck pain, you know, a lot of shoulder pain because that's where this, you know, some of us carry our stress. And so if we're feeling these things, acknowledge them and make sure that you uh, connect to the appropriate help to not let these things linger. When they linger is when they start to become uh, uh, disabling, you know, where we can't uh, connect and we can't uh, emote, we can't relate in healthy ways, you know? And so uh, simple, simple things that we can start doing regularly, drinking more water, breathing exercises, yoga, meditation, creating a healthy spiritual life, you know, connecting with friends and family members, making sure we talk about what we've experienced and not suppressing them, making sure that we have uh, resources outside of our regular family circle, professional help like Lisa Johnson, like Issa, which is a great friend of mine as well, you know, making sure we connect to the resource that are available. And when the resources aren't available, making sure that we can reach out to people who may be able to connect us to those resources, you know. So this, just some of the tips, I don't want to go on and on about this, but that's just some of the things that were on my mind about that. That is so awesome. Thank you so much. You know, I, I thought about, you know, um, I know there's probably people thinking, you know, while we're rehashing um, the George Floyd case and, you know, what happened um, a year ago, but I'm so glad you hit on so much in the trauma because I'm one that have dealt with trauma from a little girl um, and even, you know, throughout my years, the trauma on top of trauma on top of trauma, it builds a monster, you know, and if you don't deal with the trauma, you're going to have an unhealthy person, you're going to have an unhappy person, and you can have a person that would be here today, but gone the, ne- the same day, because you're not dealing with that trauma, and I like the fact that you brought out that this was a traumatic event, and it's not just I'm sure his family, of course, but not just his family, but even others. We may not even know him as an individual or know Breonna Taylor or know Ahmaud Marbury, all the other people, but because they look like us, because we may have heard, you know, um, in our families that, you know, this is what happened years ago and, you know, don't trust this person or don't trust that person. And you're trying to, you know, deal with some of the traumas you already have. And then now, boom, going through a pandemic and not being able to socialize, you know, that's traumatic for some people, especially if you're dealing with certain mental health issues. So you're already having to deal with that. 
I can tell you now, I had many sleepless nights. I was very hurt. I was hurt as a human being. I was hurt as a as a um, African American woman. Uh, you know, I, I I was just hurt. You know that someone would you know take a life that that way, and then just to it was televised everywhere. You know, to see his life actually you know um, leave him. You know, it was so much. But I like the fact that. Um, you went through the stages of um, grief because it is so true. And again, if it's not, you know, one of a person that's in our family, we still go through those stages. And what happens, especially with our black young men, because you're holding all of this anger inside, because people have told you that, you know, you're a man, you shouldn't cry, or, you know, um, you got to be strong, or you have to be strong for the family, you, you, you can deal with your anger. We want you to deal with your anger because guess what? If you don't deal with your anger, you're going to be seeing someone like Officer Mills. And that's what we want to stop. We want to stop that in our Black community. I want to hear from um, Kashamba Miller because she um, has, has had years of experience education in the school system. So Kashamba, if you could share with us you know, um, what you have, and I know it's, it's a little different right now because there, a lot of um, the education has been virtual, but what you have seen, what you have heard, um, even if it's not the George Floyd case, but cases that are similar. Thank you so much for the question. Well, as you know, um, as you mentioned, many of the kids have been virtual, but of course you've had some that have come back to the schools for that social piece. Um, as you mentioned, with the pandemic, as well as the George Floyd situation, um, it has caused the kids, some of the kids, not all, um, but it has caused many of them, as Josiah mentioned, to just wonder, you know, what was going on and, and trying to figure out how they could process this information. Um, we have mental health counselors at each school, and I am speaking with many of my colleagues um, they're able to utilize those counselors in these situations. And as we know, this came from the Marjorie Stoneman Act where every school had to have a mental health counselor there. Um, many of the children, they find themselves just, you know, just questioning why did that happen? And, you know, we've been very fortunate in the city of Riviera Beach to not have to experience anything such as that. Um, I'm getting a little feedback. Are you hearing that, Lisa, or is it just me? I am. I'm just going to ask everyone if they would put their um, phones on mute. If there's anyone that's, that phone is not on mute, if you can just put your phone on mute. Thank you. No problem. So, you know, in the city of Riviera Beach, as I said, we've been very fortunate to not have situations like that. And, and what we've tried to do is try to really capitalize on building relationships um, with our police officers and our community members, especially our youth. Um, when we, before the uh, school district was able to provide police officers in every school, we did have our resource officers in our schools. And so we utilized that time for them to one, you know, just try to build those relationships and, and be there as a positive role model and to show them that, you know, our school officers, our police officers are your friends. They are there to help. Yes, that did happen um, to George Floyd but that should not be the norm and that shouldn't be what they expect of police officers. So I know the city of Riviera Beach has certainly worked very hard at maintaining those relationships with the children as well as their families. And then within the schools, working with families who have, you know, most of the times families are usually the last ones to realize that their children are having issues most times it's the um, friends of the children that recognize or they may see that they're posting things on social media or they may hear them talking about things just casually and not all the times do the children take it seriously but you do have a few that have been very engaged with what's going on with everyone's mental health and knowing that if you hear of a friend that's saying things that seem to be a little, you know, different from what 
from what their normally um, their normal behavior is. Um, they've learned how to be able to get, engage with the mental health counselors. And so I think what has come out of this, especially with the pandemic, we've been able to see our children really become a little more mature for some, where they have probably, I would assume, have watched the news a little more because at one point, I'm sure children were more engaged with the media than they probably normally would be after that event occurred. And um, in many ways, it was a positive thing because it got them to pay attention and to realize, you know, there was a serious issue that was going on and it prompted them to start asking questions. And so I think with having um, family members and, and mental health counselors and just people in the community that are able to assist them in processing it um, at this time, it has provided a, a great deal of support. Um, as I said before, it's, it's a work in progress for the cities as well as the schools, but I, I think we're, we're starting to see that we're able to make some sort of positive change this with this. So hopefully I was able to answer your question a little bit. You, you were, thank you so much, Kashamba. Um, yeah, social, social piece, I, I, I like that you brought that up because I know I, I've heard from many youth, I've, you know, I work with a lot of young people as well and have been doing that for um, almost two decades now. And, you know, I understand and I have my own children as well and even my grandchildren, you know, um, they need to be, they, they're social beings. God made us to be, you know, social beings. So they need that social peace and hearing all that. And then they also need, you know, it makes me think about the Abraham Maslow hierarchy of needs, you know. Um, one of that is that we need people and, and we also need that sense of security. So I like the fact that um, the schools have the mental health counselors, that they have the police officers, and the police officers that are not just there, you know, just to show that they're to, there to protect them, but police officers have also, you know, probably found themselves being counselors in uh, me and Officer Dexter uh, Mills have had that conversation, you know, about just the different roles of the police officer. And I'm going to, you know, have him to talk um, in a few minutes as well, um, how, you know, they find themselves having to be a counselor, you know, the family members and all of that as well. So um, before I move on to um, that, um, also, it was something I wanted to ask Kashamba. Kashamba. In terms of any anger, have you noticed from that situation, and I'm sure if school was open during that time, it probably would have manifested itself a little more, but have you noticed like any um, anger, you know, in kids being displayed against different races? You know, I think that would be on a case by case basis in terms of the schools. Um, obviously, a school that I work at is majority African American. And so, um, even with other races that are there, we've never had, for the most part, um, race type um, negative interactions. And so, I would say that, you know, it, it probably just speaking with some colleagues who are spread out across the county, um, maybe at the very beginning of the year you may have had, but I would assume that was probably something that they probably had anyway. Um, it may have heightened it, but I, I have not been made aware of any new type of um, interactions that are occurring because of it. That is awesome. That is awesome. And like I said, I'm sure, you know, if school was open during the time, because you heard so much, you, you, you saw on the news, you know, just a civil and social unrest. And that is what we don't want. And we want our children to make a difference, um, no matter what color, um, you're, what color you are. So I want to, um, right before I go to Officer Mills, I want to hear from um, Raphael, my brother, Raphael Defreitas, as a young man, you know, how you felt, um, he's an adult male, um, and if, you know, you've ever been stopped, if there's any, like, indifference there. Sorry about that, sis, I had left from where I was at, I was at the park, uh, okay. walking in the house right now. One second.
Sorry about that, y'all. Uh, so one more time, sis. Sorry. One more time. Okay. So just want to hear from you as a young adult male, you know, regarding um, what happened with George Floyd, things that have happened before, um, with, you know, just police brutality, your experience, if you have any with law enforcement, and just how you feel as a young man and what you have done, you know, good or bad, you know, or to even better, you know, yourself or your community because of um, what has occurred. Okay, well, yeah, I, as growing up as a Black man in South Florida, I have experienced my uh, police encounters. Um, I would say all of it was my fault why I had to meet them because who I placed myself around um, and what I was trying to accomplish by gaining the name uh, for safety. Well, I don't know why we think that, but uh, we do that. So um, luckily the officers that I came in contact with were, uh, were the good ones. Uh, I did have a few, uh, oh, let me throw the phone on the charger. I did have a few um, meetups with a, with a few bad ones before, uh, but luckily God had me covered. Uh, so um, what I'm doing now is uh, like I was saying, I'm, I'm happy you said like we taught this man that we don't supposed to uh, cry and show emotion and all that. Cause that's basically what I tell the guys who I work with is that if you hold this anger in, all you're going to do is teach it to your kids. So these kids are growing up with secondhand PTSD from your experience and their experience might not be your experience. Uh, so um, that's what I'm doing now, working with youth, working with men my age, men older, helping them, um, you know, get this stuff out of their heart so they can learn how to see an, the next person not in the same light as they did with the first other, other people who hurt them, basically. Uh, so that's what that anthology brutal curve was, was about it was about a group of men getting together telling traumatic stuff from their past and these guys uh, had the opportunity to get their name on the cover so now they are uh, not only were they independent uh, not independent not only were they uh, published uh, and, and became authors but now they had the opportunity to become entrepreneurs by selling the book and making money uh, for themselves and not me just sitting there collecting money off of they, they, they traumatic past, you know what I'm saying? So uh, right. um, that's, yeah, that's basically what I'm doing. I'm a, a certified life purpose coach because I realized that a lot of people, you know, you go to these careers and you do this stuff and then sometimes you sit back and be like, but what, what is my purpose though? Yeah, this is a passion or something or, you know, something, a hobby, but what, what is my purpose here on this planet? You know, and uh, I think we get caught up within the uh, day to day life of what we think we're supposed to do. So that's why I kind of started doing that to uh, help people see, you know, that um, there are answers. You just have to search for them and work to get them. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Uh, OK, that is, you know, that is that is good. So basically you took a lot of, you know, your traumatic past and you put it into writing. Um, I can relate because I'm a writer as well. So I guess it runs in the family. Um, and then you didn't just do it alone, but you also um, helped other people. Um, I'm glad you did, you know, kind of piggyback on, you know, being a male and having that feeling before that, you know, you have to hold your emotions in. You mentioned that you've had encounters with the with police officers and it was your fault. I like the fact that you acknowledged and you took ownership for it because that's so important, you know, for us to take ownership and that's gonna segue uh, me into um, Officer Mills. And um, I'm gonna ask um, Officer Mills just to talk a little bit about, you know, some of the training that he has done. I know you cannot get like deep in detail because um, you are still working for a PBSO and we don't want you to violate any policies, but just some of the trainings that officers are taught and, um, you know, what happens when a person is stopped and uh, resisting arrest and how, how does all of that go? So if you would take yourself off of mute. I think you're still on mute. Got you. Okay. Yeah. Um, what was the question again, Liz? 
Okay, so I asked um, a few, it's okay, I asked a few questions. So just want to um, talk about just the training that you, let's start there, with the, some of the training that you provide for um, police officers. Oh, um, at the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office, we have an um, extensive training program. Um, the officer um, are taught, um, once they uh, complete the academy and um, on occasions, uh, we have officers um, that come to the agency uh, from other agencies. However, they have to go through the training um, of Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office. And um, some of the training that um, the officers receive is um, defensive tactics, um, they um, drivers um, course, um, they uh, receive training in um, de-escalation of force, use of force uh, tactics, self-defense, um, dealing with um, stress awareness, um, officer uh, survival skills, and um, it goes on. Um, the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office takes um, training very seriously. And um, I will say that um, for the de-escalation of force, um, we was one of the first um, in the county or in, um, I would say probably in the country that um, was dealing and, and um, teaching de-escalation of force prior to the, um, the Floyd um, incident. That is awesome. Yes, I know we um, actually talked about that. So, um, like I say, I know, you know, you can't get deep into your policies and procedures, but um, what about like when you say de-escalation of force, um, what can you tell the young people um, in terms of, you know, resisting arrest? Like if you're stopped by an officer and you have an arrest and young people, please listen up because it's so important. You know, I think especially when you may not know that um, there are so many, I work in human resources and, you know, I found that a lot of people say, well, I had a warrant out, you know, for my arrest, you know, and I didn't know that I had the warrant. It could be because they may have moved or whatever. So when you're stopped and, you and you're told that, you know, they have to take you in because of warrant, you know, for your arrest, it's like surprising to them. So I, I don't know if it's the fight or flight that kicks in, and I know uh, my therapist, you know, can 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 jump in and help with that. But Officer Mills, I mean, in terms of resisting arrest, what is your training that you can share with young people, um, young and older, in terms of not to resist arrest from an officer? Um, I would say a lot of that um, with the resisting arrest um, comes with um, a lack of communication. We can all agree that law enforcement is a um, difficult and a dangerous profession. Um, as a result, um, there is sometimes a breakdown in communication between law enforcement and the public, especially young adults. Um, the public perception of law enforcement is vital and important. Um, police safety and the uh, um, ability of law enforcement to keep us all safe rely heavily on the co um, cooperation of the local community and law enforcement and um, vice versa. Um, however, there are some measures that you can take um, when being um, arrested. Um, I'm not always in uniform. I have gotten pulled over on numerous occasions. And, you know, um, yeah, I do believe that sometimes you could be um, stereotyped um, or whatever. Um, especially, um, and it has happened to me on numerous occasions um, by the, um, the type of um, vehicles um, that I drive. However, you know, that's not an excuse, but, you know, we can all agree that it does happen. And uh, for the young adults um, or whatever, there is some um, tips, you know, that I could provide um, or whatever, if you're stopped, caution or attained by law enforcement, I mean, is when you approach, you know, be respectful. Um, retain your composure, conduct yourself 
as a mature manner, avoid uh, foul language or um, situations that, you know, can endanger your well-being and the officer's well-being because, you know, neither one of you are familiar with each other and neither um, know what the other uh, person's intentions um, is. Your um, priorities should be alleviated to minimize the potential charges and the use of force against um, you. And some tips that, um, other tips that um, I might add is um, if you are stopped or pulled over, you might wanna be pulled over in a, a lighted area um, or whether, whatever, you know, we all know that video cameras and stuff is a big thing now when um, dealing with law enforcement, everybody got a um, cell phone, everybody's doing recording um, or whatever. And if you're gonna, um, once you're approached by um, law enforcement, you're being pulled over, you know, if you do have a um, cell phone at your um, and you don't feel safe because it's a dark area, get on the phone, dial 911, call um, communications and let them know what your intentions are so that law enforcement, uh, law enforcement wouldn't um, think you're trying to flee. You know what I'm saying? Explain to them that you, you know, you're afraid you're being stopped and you want to be in a an area and then they'll follow you. And then, you know, you ain't got to um, be concerned about, you know, um, the officer getting hostile and coming up thinking you were trying to flee or you were trying to um, hide um, something um, or whatever. And um, also, um, whenever you encounter law enforcement, I know a lot of people, I mean, even me sometimes, because I don't know what their intentions and stuff gonna be when I'm not um, in uniform and I'm in plain clothes or, um, or whatever, that you are not always gonna get pulled over and given a ticket um, or whatever. Sometimes the attitude dictates on what the situation is gonna be. I mean, you may be pulled over because you have a tail light out or you, um, have a um, um, the tag is expired um, or whatever, but you know sometimes you know you're not gonna get a ticket, but your attitude dictates to the officer how he's gonna respond. He may even just give you a warning um, or whatever, send you on your way, because every encounter with law enforcement it doesn't require a ticket. It doesn't require you to go to jail um or whatever and you know and for us resisting it's not uh resisting arrest i know you asked that question too you know and yeah sometimes that fight or flight um or whatever instinct uh kicks in but it's not advisable um because you know sometimes um you know the situation might seem like it's gonna be hard, but if you figure it out, you know, and what a lot of officers, they would try to um, explain to you your options, what you can do, you know, to rectify the situation. You know, okay, you got a warrant um, or whatever for um, driving while license suspended um, or whatever. Okay, you know, they will talk you through the situation, you know, or, or um, what the bond is gonna be, or how you could rectify the situation by going to court and getting it straight um, or whatever, because you know there are times where you know people get pulled over, you know, and giving um, the officer a false name because it's their sister, or brother, um, or whatever, and they don't want to go to jail, so they're going to use their sister or brother's name and identity, you know, to try to um, escape the possibility or being detained or going to jail, but um, there's a variety um, of things you can do. But like I said, I wouldn't advise anybody to resist arrest um, or whatever, because it puts your safety in danger and also the officer's safety in danger. Okay, that is that is really, really good. You gave you really gave some good tips and I hope um, young people were listening. I'm going to just call off some of them. First of all, do not resist arrest. 
no matter what. Don't resist the rest. Um, be respectful. Maintain your composure. Avoid foul language. That is so good because I hear that a lot. I see it a lot when I'm watching TV, et cetera. Um, know people that would just, you know, go to cursing and, you know, have anger issues and then they want to, you know, go off, you know, on the police officer, um, go to a lighted area. That is, that is really good. And I know, you know, sometimes it does pose like a conflict. So I like the fact that you said that you can call 911 and tell them that, you know, you feel unsafe um, and the purpose of you using your phone. What I've been hearing lately is cops saying, turn off the turn off your camera. You still have your camera on. I mean, I'm asking you as a police officer, and I know we did talk about different agencies have their own guidelines, but as a, a Palm Beach County Sheriff officer, um, is, is that legal to tell someone to turn off their camera on their phone? Well, I wouldn't say that um, it's legal or illegal. Um, um, most officers, which I don't know of many um, in our agency, you know, um, that's your right. You and your own personal vehicle um, or whatever, um, recording um, them unless, you know, um, they got something to um, hide. But, you know, you don't want to have you if, if you are approached by the officer, you want to be concentrating on the reason why you're being pulled over, why um, you're being stopped. So just to record the um, conversation, you know, I don't, you know, um, think that will be, um, it shouldn't be feasible because I mean, yeah, some officers might feel that, okay, the phone is in the hand or whatever, it can be used as a weapon and officers, all officers in whatever agency, officer safety comes first. But I mean, you don't want to get a, a, a phone and say, oh, I'm recording this conversation and, you know, put it all up in the um, officer face um, or whatever, um, because I mean, that, that, that phone could be used as a weapon. Okay. Okay. So, so you would advise, I mean, that if, because honestly, I mean, just because of what's going, gone, what has occurred? I know that there are so many people that will feel more comfortable with recording it. And, you know, and I've thought about it, you know, if I'm ever, okay. stopped, I'm, a, I'm a female, um, you know, I want to have my phone, but it's the way that you conduct yourself. Is that where you're saying, like, don't be putting it in their face? Um, is it the way that you should handle yourself? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, I will say if you want to record the incident or the encounter, if you're going to record the incident or the encounter, you know, put the phone in a safe place, you know, put it on the dashboard, put it in the seat or, you know, um, they have um, cell phone holders and stuff now, you know, and just advise the um, officer, you know, that, you, you know, um, you're going to record um, the incident um, or whatever. And I don't um, see why he would have a problem with it. Um, okay. because, um, you know, but the waving it around and holding, yeah, I'm recording this incident because you pulling me over and I don't know what's going to um, happen, you know, right there is presenting a bad attitude. And right. when what he pulled you over for probably could have took five seconds, but now then turn into minutes. And then now you're going to prolong him. So now you're going to give him a reason to dig for other things that could have um, be wrong or that right. he could have um, added, you know, prior to stopping him. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, that's good. You know, because when you were saying that, it's true, you know, law, enfor law, office, law enforcement officers are trained, I guess, to make sure that you're not, you know, trying to hide something or buy some time on something. So um, listen up, you, we want to be very careful on how we record, maybe once the sirens go on, you know, just turn your phone on. <laughs> I'm not gonna give the advice. Just, you know, be careful. Be very, very careful. Yes, Officer Mills. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So now what I want to do, I want to um, thank you so much. Thank you. I really, really appreciate that. I, I do have another question though, because we are talking about um, <laughs> excessive force 
you know, the de-escalation of force, like what if you are um, thrown, th th um, I mean, handled so aggressively by an officer, like what do you do? Okay. I mean, um, you say handled wrong by an officer. I mean, aggressively, like maybe thrown to the car because, you know, I've seen it where, and not just males, but females now, where officers are kind of like throwing them to the ground or thrown, you know, what do you do? Okay. Again, we're going back um, to, you know, what led up to um, the way the officer responded. You know, did the officer feel that um, his safety was being jeopardized? Or mm -hmm. um, was the officer just having a bad day and just, you know, taking out on the um, public citizen, which, you know, I don't know, um, that's, it's not acceptable mm -hmm. um, or whatever, but like I say, um, it depends on, you know, attitude has um, a whole lot to do with it. And in the event that the officer was having a bad day, he slams a person down um, or whatever to the ground um, or whatever, and go, you know, escalating the force um, when it didn't have to be. I mean, there's um, different steps you could take. You can, you know, get the officer's name. You can get his badge number. You can file a uh, complaint with um, internal affairs um, or whatever. And, um, but for us getting in a physical confrontation uh, with them, and, you know, trying to fight back, you know, it wouldn't um, be um, advisable because, you know, everybody's different. The way I encounter um, an incident might be totally different from um, another officer, um, how he hands, um, handles the incident. You know, I may try to talk him down um, or whatever, but uh, he may decide to use his OC or, you um, his taser or um or whatever to gain um to maintain and gain uh, control of the situation you know and um a lot of um this you know you have to take in um the consideration to size of the individual you know the size okay mm -hmm. if the individual okay you're talking about um an individual might be 300 pounds or whatever Okay, you the officer, you 180 pounds or whatever. Okay, the way you're gonna handle the force is gonna be totally different, especially if the person is combative. You know, if the individual is combative or whatever, yeah, you, if you don't have any fear, you should have some fear. If you're 180 pounds and this guy is 300 uh, pounds and he's coming at you. But a lot of things can be um, turned around and you could gain compliance just with a simple conversation. Right, okay, cool. I have a couple of things in the chat that says, in my personal opinion, I think people are starting to record based on past experiences of cops illegally abusing their authority. Um, and then there's a comment um, from, and that was from Issa, um, one of our licensed mental health um, therapists and then Matt, our um, family therapist, sometimes that that's all we have as our defense, as compliance. And as we have seen in the past, that it may not be enough. That's, that's, that's very true. So, I mean, the thing about it, I really, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that everyone is hearing, you know, what everyone is saying, what the officers are saying. I mean, Officer uh, Mills is recommending. It doesn't have to be that way, but we know there are some times where, you know, you just may get that cop that just may have some issues against black people or may have some issues against Asian people or, you know, whatever it may be. And, you know, you're in the wrong place at the right time, in the wrong time. So, you know, we really have to just pray as well, you know, for God's protection. So, you know, um, Lisa, I'm not saying don't do it, but um, like anything else, it's a way to do everything. Right. You know? I'm not saying, you know, I mean, it, it I mean, I, I don't I don't find a problem with it personally. Right. You know what right. I'm saying? But it's a way to do anything. You know, like I said on at the beginning, you don't want to get the camera or the cell phone and just put it all, you know, in front of the office face or the officer face in a threatening manner um, or whatever. If you're gonna record it, you know, record it. I mean, you can record it and you don't even have to let the officer know. 
That's right. That's right. You, you know, and uh, but I'm saying, you know, how some of us we we get agitated. Um, or whatever. First of all, we're being pulled over, and you think you're being pulled over for no reason, um, or whatever. Um, and then the officer approaches the vehicle, um, or whatever. Now you're agitated and you're pissed off due to the fact that you're being pulled over. Okay. At that point in time, I mean, you don't have to just stick your cell phone out. You know, put it in his face and say, hey, you know, I'm recording this because I don't trust you guys and this and that or um, whatever. Now you are you are you are, you are escalating the incident. You know what I'm saying? You can record. Like I say, they got um, cell phone stands for the vehicles and stuff. Yes. Record it. Yes. Record it. You know, you don't have to let them record it. Right. <clears throat> Very good. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate and I salute you um, as an officer, you know, of our county um, and, you know, the safety and protection that you provide, you know, as well as well as um, your agency. Thank you so much. Um, officer um, Mills and I had such a, a good conversation because I needed to find out the questions I can ask or should and shouldn't ask. And, you know, a lot of good came out of it. And we talked a lot about what the officers, you know, have to go through as well. And I'm sure, you know, after, you know, the George Floyd incident and, you know, the, all of the other incidents that, you know, the officers had to deal with that as well. Do you want to kind of talk about that? I mean, you know, like I say, you know, it, it, it um, boils down to the training. Every um, agency doesn't receive the um, same training um, mm -hmm. or whatever. Some receive more training than um, others. And I can say for us, um, our county, the um, Palm Beach County Sheriff Office, um, we receive, um, our officers think uh, we receive too much training because we are constantly um, in training, you know. Um, right, but any backlash, did you all receive any? I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Did you all receive any backlash, you know, in terms of um, the George Floyd case and then, you know, the pressure, you know, on the cops at that point? Of course, you know, it affected, you know, a lot of people because, you know, um, some, um, People in the um, public, you know, they'll look at law enforcement that, like everybody's the same, mm -hmm. you know, and everybody's not the same, you know, um, or whatever. Um, we um, here in Palm Beach County, you know, we have an emphasis on, you know, being community oriented, you know what I'm saying? We have um, community policing um, in our agency. Our officers, you know, actually you know, go out, you know, walk around, talk with the agencies. Um, we got different programs um, that we um, have and to um, assist um, the youth um, or whatever, um, such as, you know, um, DARE and um, PAL, and there's um, a few others. And, um, but for us, the backlash, yeah, we did. And um, I wouldn't say it was directly, uh, it was directed altogether as um, law enforcement as a whole. But, you know, during that time um, period and after um, the um, incident, the public viewed law enforcement in a different perspective. Um, due to the fact that, you know, like I said, you know, some say, oh, you know, you see one cop, all cops are like, which, you know, we as individuals and adults or in, um, kids or whatever, we know we got good cops in every agency. We got bad cops in every agency. Every family has usually, um, every family has a cousin, an uncle or a daughter or a husband or a wife or a sister or brother in um, law enforcement. Right. And um, like we discussed, you know, they want to see um, their loved ones come home too. You right. know, what happened was unfortunate um, or whatever. And me on a personal, just, just my personal opinion, you know, not having anything to do with law enforcement, I, I felt it, you know, just went too far. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I really appreciate that. 
Um, thank you so much, Officer Mills. I want to move on to Kitty London. Kitty, in the after the George Floyd case, um, she actually, you know, made a song, and it is. I mean, it just so hit home. It was very, you know, heartbreaking. You know, as a mother, and it's called um, "Now I Can't Breathe." And unfortunately, we were unable to play it due to. Um, just some technical difficulties, but it's called Now I Can't Breathe, and it's by Kitty London. You can check it out on YouTube. Kitty, as a mother, how did you feel? What made you write that song and make the video? Okay, thank you again um, for having me. And I just wanted to say real quick, uh, thank you to Matt for telling us the, uh, the stress symptoms. I thought my back was hurting because of all that COVID weight I gained, but Yes, we were very stressed out uh, the year 2020. And I, I forgot to mention that um, I work for Comcast. I've been there almost 19 years. And last year, like most of us, we were all home. We were forced to uh, watch everything that was unfolding in front of our eyes. And I would see this every day. And you know, I say that George Floyd's death actually happened at a perfect time because even though it was tragic, because most of us, we've seen black men get abused by police officers. Many, we, we can name them, just like everyone can call out a name, right? But what was, what was about George Floyd that was different is the world had stopped. We all were forced to watch him take his last breath on TV over and over and over again, the knees on the neck over and over again. Um, we had, you know how people say, we have time today. So we had time to march, we had time to protest, we had time to, you know, force these companies to talk about diversity and inclusion. Sorry for my dogs barking in the background. He, he's, he's, you know, he's right with me. He's, he's like, yes, mom, tell him. <laughs> but um, we were forced to do that. So as I'm sitting here as a mom watching George Floyd call out his mother in the midst of him dying, I felt my sons at that time. And you know we had this thing called I can't breathe. So this is why I, I made the piece called Now I Can't Breathe because anyone knows as a mother, when you think about when your child was sick, right? You couldn't sleep, you couldn't rest either, right? You were them, you wanted to take on their pain. So if a, if a, a man is saying, I can't breathe as a mother, as a sister, as an aunt, as a whatever, you're connected to that man. Now you can't breathe. So as a musician, I felt like music for me was therapy, you know, because of COVID, a lot of us really couldn't protest the way we wanted to. We couldn't do a lot of the marching, you know, for many different reasons. So I said, you know what, I'm going to create a piece and I'm going to shoot a video. And this is why I did it. And the first lyric that came, I wrote the song in like two days, right? So the first lyric that came to me was, you know, as a black mother, what do you tell your son? They can kill you with their knees. They don't need guns. All they see is your black skin as a threat. They don't care how many degrees you're about to get. And for my sons who are not in the streets, who don't have a record, who are just the best to me, when they go out in those streets or they get pulled over, the cop doesn't know that they are, they're, you know, GPA is 3.5. They're honor roll students. They don't have a record. They don't have anything in the car. They look at them as black children. And God forbid they have a hoodie on. God forbid they're listening to loud music, right? Because this is what teenagers do. We did it. But now you look at the stereotypes across America that these children now are looked at as thugs and hoodlums. They don't care how many degrees they're about to get. They don't care if they just left college and about to have a doctor's degree. They just see the appearance. And for me as a mother, it scared me. So I, I, I made it as an art and you know it went national, thank goodness. Um, fast forward now, we are all class of, of 2021. We're all graduates now. My son is high school, my other son's college. And then I just um, got my college degree again. So awesome. it, you know we, we had academics through a pandemic. And I, I love him and I, you know, I know he's great, but the world will not know him as my baby Kobe. They'll see him as a black man. And, and right now we have to change that, you know, and just like um, Officer Mills said, it's not how you do, it's what you do. But I think we're so tense right now and we're so scared that when you are approached by an officer, there's fear on both ends. One fear is, am I gonna get a ticket or am I gonna die? And that's the reality of it now. And then we can, 
you know, picture it different ways, but that's the reality. And we're scared. And this is why the cameras are out. This is why people don't want to go anywhere alone anymore because they need that third eye. Um, because we've seen what happens when the cameras are off. Just imagine how many people have died when the cameras were not rolling um, and you don't have a backup, you know? So this is why I wrote the song. And as a mother, I'm going to keep fighting for the black men and black women. Um, so we have a voice. That is so awesome. Oh my goodness, you almost made me cry. <laughs> it doesn't take <laughs> much, <laughs> but I'm like, oh my goodness. Yes, you are telling the truth because I am a mother and I have two um, sons as well. And, and I have a daughter, you know, so I completely understand and I appreciate, you know, what you have done and, and how that has, you know, gone out to the masses. Kitty, you're absolutely right. It's gone all over the world, you know, your song. And I just wanted to kind of hear from you, you know, the pain and what you felt because you're not the only mother. I'm sure many mothers feel that way. I remember the many nights that, you know, I stayed up and I've cried and I prayed, you know, for God to protect my son, you know, and I mean, still do, you know, as a mother, but, you know, when you have, you know, a, a child that, you know, becomes wayward, you know, it's, it's even more difficult, especially when you're working hard and you're doing whatever you're, you know, you can do to, to take care of them. And then, you know, they're falling at the hands of, you know, law enforcement where it doesn't have to be, you know, and I, I agree, you know, Officer Mills said there are things that could escalate an issue. And that's why we're educating our, our youth on today. Don't escalate it. But then there's other times when it doesn't even have to be escalated. It's still the color of your skin. This is what, this is the cry on today. Let it stop. We want to come together as one. And I know, you know, we have many organizations that have been preaching this and talking about this lately. We want to let you know that Oasis Church International and Oasis Community Development Center, we are there with you. We want to join with the law enforcement officers. Um, Officer Mills didn't mention um, the organization that he's with Noble, but, you know, there's a law, a law enforcement agency that I want us to, um, you know, kind of partner with even more. And we are with you and we want the community to come together and anyone that wants to join with us so we can come together and we can stop this and we can educate our young people. They're our tomorrow. Um, before we um, mention the names of of um, our winners, I would I would love for Matthew um, Jean to close us out with thank you everyone, thank you, um, Kashamba. Did you have anything else to say? I'm sorry because I did mention to her she's a mother as well of one son. Um, I did mention to her if she had anything else to say. If you do, you have anything to say, Kashamba? No, I I certainly agree with you and Kitty as well regarding the having the black son. Um, you know, I mean the same thing same sentiment. So, um, and I just want to say thank you for having this forum and this platform to reach out to um, all of our young individuals and just provide some sort of um, answers and, and, and ways in which to guide them through this process. Thank, thank you, you so much. I appreciate it. Um, Matthew, it is on you. If you could, you know, kind of close us out with some additional tips you've heard from an educator, you heard from our youth, you've heard from um, Officer Mills, uh, Corporal Mills, um, and you said some things. What are some closing words that you can say from a mental health standpoint? Because no matter what, when it all boils down, our mental health is affected. Definitely. I want to thank Officer Mills for sharing some of those coping and those tips that he gave to all of us, we could definitely utilize some of them. Um, I also want to thank um, Kitty and Kobe for sharing their stories and hope I'm looking forward to hearing the song myself. Um, here's some things that we can definitely do collectively to make sure that all of us are on the same page, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, is do more of these, have more of these. You know, these are so important when we gather together as a collective and share and process our emotions. This is something that I was hoping to see more of last year and ongoing. We don't have to wait for trauma and tragedy to get together like this and speak on the topic of mental health. Mental health is something that we all need to address on a consistent basis. And so as we normalize these conversations between officers and community, mental health professionals and community, my hope is that these forums can become more popular in all of our communities to where it's happening in real time in our homes, at the dinner table, 
at the school bus, on the college campus, wherever we were, wherever we are, we having these conversations about where we are mentally, where we are emotionally, how we can grow and support each other as a community, how we can benefit from the resources we have right here in our communities, you know, right. tapping into those resources and making sure that we're not in denial about what we're experiencing, you know, no more sweeping these things under the rug and making sure we can bring these things to the forefront and address them in real time so that they won't become compounded and eventually be cause us to be in a state of post-traumatic stress, you know? So making sure we address these things, having more forms like this, and I believe this was a very important form. So thank you guys for allowing us to come together and share. Thank you so much, Matthew. We will definitely be having more of these. Um, just to let you know, Oasis Church um, International and Oasis Community Development Center um, has mental health at, at the forefront of um, our ministry in our um, 501c3 organization. Every month we have a mental health moment and um, that's where, you know, I've been giving out just brief nuggets on something to do with mental health and we're there to provide tools and resources, awareness to the community. Um, we have a team now um, that has been built of people, like-minded individuals, anyone that is interested in just coming alongside us again, we welcome you. I cannot forget my little brother. Thank you so much, Ralph, for coming on and um, sharing just how you how you felt as, you know, I feel as a young man. And um, I, I got to say, I'm so proud of, you know, where, um, where you have gone and um, landed and continue to do your book. Um, young men, if you're interested, you know, in reaching out to someone that has been through some things as well, you know, and I like the fact that you've gotten in together, writing is therapeutic, um, exercising, Matthew said it earlier, exercising is therapeutic, um, yoga is therapeutic, um, deep breathing, I, that's one of the things that I do, it's therapeutic. So we got to make sure that our mental health um, is in um, is in good shape and good condition um, so we can do everything that we want to do and what God has us here to do and I know that it's not just to sit back and be sad so thank you everyone thank you to my pastor I really really appreciate you thank you to Issa um, who has been typing on the sides um, she has the YouTube video um, on the side if you want to watch it if you're on um, Zoom you can um take the YouTube video information. And again, it's called Now I Can't Breathe by Kitty London. Thank you all of the youth that are here participating as well. So I am going to call out the names of those youth that have um, been on and very engaged. I saw you all engaged, young people. So I'm very happy about that. So you will receive a $20 gift card. Um, it would be to Chick-fil-A. It would be um, also to Amazon, and we may have some Visa gift cards. So the first recipient is Ethan Holland. Ethan Holland, who's an eighth grade student. Brianna Ulysses, ninth grade. Dwayne, Dwayne Murdoch, seventh grade. Um, Asian Hall, 11th grade. Cole, Lo Logan Cole, 10th grade. Zion McArthur, 10th grade. Um, Elijah Harris, um, he is in high school, don't have the grade, but he's in high school. Thank you, Elijah. Um, Blessing Ellis, 10th grade. Alexis Newberry, 11th grade, my little cousin. Kayla Davis, 11th grade. Kiara Davis, um, 9th grade. We also have Destiny Murdoch, who is also in the um, 7th grade. She will be receiving um, a gift certificate. We have Troy Ellis, um, sorry, close, um, 10th grade. We have Delana Johnson, um, ninth grade. We have Logan Davis, seventh grade. Christeria Thompson, ninth grade. And Josiah Manners as well. So those are our recipients. Thank you so much again for joining you all. Have a blessed day. Stay tuned. Um, we will be having another mental health um, awareness forum. 
in the month of July, and that would be on grief. And we're going to be dealing with um, a lot of people that have lost um, loved ones, friends, family, coworkers, et cetera, due to um, the social pandemic. So you all take care, be blessed, and thank you so much. Bye. Bye.